Welcome to Queens College Physics Department Summer Session Lab Number Nine: Momentum and Impulse. Um, this is the uh, introduction page that you'll see. Uh, this lab talks about momentum and impulse. Uh, we talked about momentum last time, but we were um, more interested in the uh, the conservation of momentum. Uh, we would take a picture of what happened before a collision and after a collision, and we would kind of ignore what happened during the collision. And we're going to take care of that today. Uh, impulse is the way you change momentum. You'll see that in the theory of the Google Doc, and hopefully you'll study it in lecture. I'm going to show you uh, exactly how I collected the data. Um, but first, I want to show you the data itself, since I'm here. The second page is equipment. Uh, the uh, cart is going to run up and down the track. Uh, I'll give it an initial velocity. It will collide with this black barrier. There will be something on the front of the cart. A spring, a piece of clay, a rubber knob, and a magnetic bumper. Uh, you have the masses for all of those cases here, plus you have an additional mass for the spring with additional weight. And those are the five runs you're going to have to do here. Pay attention when you're watching the video to the relative speeds of how these collisions happen. Try and get a sense of it because there will be questions in the theory. So the data itself, when you open it up, you'll get something that looks like this. Um, I have two sensors here. Here I have the rotary encoder and the velocity. That's going to be the light blue curve. And that may be hard to see, but it's there. And I have the uh, force in newtons. And that's in a dark blue curve. Now, it's not easy to see exactly what's going on down here at the base. And you should take advantage of the scroll wheel to fix that. If I hover over the center and use a scrub wheel, it expands both ways. If I hover over an axis, it expands in that axis. And we're going to do that first. So if I come up here and click on force, I want to know the area under this curve. The, the impulse is going to be the dot product or the integral of the dot product of the force applied and the uh, time over which it was applied. So to do that, because our uh, setup is going to be uh, perpendicular or parallel, it's going to be square to one another, we don't have to worry about the uh, trigonometric portion, uh, portion and it's just about uh, multiplication. Unfortunately, because it's under such an odd curve, it's not easy to uh, work that out. Uh, you should be able to integrate this one day, but not today and not anytime soon. Uh, happily, we can get Capstone to do that for us. So instead of integrating to find the area of the curve, we're going to position the curve here. We're going to make sure it's highlighted and we're going to click on this icon, which is the area under the curve. Now, this is the area under the curve, but if you look here, it's the area under all of the curve. We don't necessarily want that. In fact, we absolutely don't want that. So what we can do is we can highlight it. Now, what do we highlight to get exactly what we want? For that, you're going to have to take the time and learn to use the scroll wheel. The scroll wheel in the middle of a plot will expand it and uh, shrink it in both directions. If you hover over a, an axis, it will look at it in that direction. Okay, so what do we want to do here? Well, we want to resize this plot. I want to take the last point before it becomes negative on this side. And the same on this side. Uh, that's zero. I could take it. You know what? It becomes zero somewhere in between, clearly. So I'm going to go in between. And I'm already covering the whole thing. As you can see, all the plots are highlighted. And I have a figure for my area. 
we're going to use as an uncertainty here 0 0.005 newton seconds. Now we have to get the velocities. We want the velocities when it is not being affected by that spring collision. So that's before. So how do I do this? First of all, let me click here so that it becomes highlighted. You have a better chance of seeing it. I'm going to shrink it down on this axis. And now I'm going to come up here and I'm going to get myself a little box. I'm going to make it smaller. I don't want this point because that's clearly within the area of the, uh, of the impulse. So I'm going to take these five or six. Let's go with five uh, data points. I'm going to hit sigma and I'm going to get a mean and we're going to uh, mean of the velocity. And we're, again, we're going to take plus or minus 0 0.005 meters per second as the uncertainty. Uh, we took five points that are close to the transition for the same re reason we did last week. Uh, there are a fair amount of uh, dissipative forces in the carts and we want to avoid that as much as possible to get the best results. When you're analyzing it, this, that's the two data points you need to collect. But when you're analyzing this, there will be questions about the transitions. For instance, um, you'll want to know or you'll be asked to figure out why this oscillates. It doesn't oscillate. Well, it oscillates a little bit. That's normal experimental error of the sensor. But here there's a significant oscillation. It's important that you remember that this is a spring. This is a spring crashing into a barrier. So, and I'll ask you about that. I told you, I will tell you, sorry, future me. I will tell you in the, um, in the video to pay attention to how long it appears that those take. You can't time it in your head, of course. You could measure the time here, but that's not necessary. You can see that it happens over a uh, particular range of time. Uh, this thing is running at 500 uh, hertz, which means it's measuring the uh, force 500 times a second, and you see how many points there are. So it took an appreciable amount of time. If we now move to the next set of data, I click here, that was procedure one, trial one. Procedure two, trial two is identical, except that uh, there's more mass involved and you're gonna do it exactly the same way. You'll spread this out and you'll spread this up and you'll bring in boxes, select the force, get a box, highlight the correct area, et cetera, et cetera. The first one that's actually different is procedure two. And you can see that it's not very different. And I will spread this out so you can see there is some difference. Here, it gets tricky here. There's a different shape between this trace, which is from the magnetic bumpers, and the spring. In fact, you should look back and forth at them both and try and understand what the difference in the shape is and why that might be. It's not about the height because that's arbitrary. It just depends on how fast I uh, gave the initial velocity. But the shape is important. Again, here your problem is where is zero? And where is the first horizontal line? Well, here, I think that's clear that you can take, let me make this smaller, you can take these five pieces and get the mean, and that would be the velocity, the initial velocity. And you can take these five and get the uh, velocity after. In fact, no, I won't take this one. I'll take this and these five. And that'll give me the final velocity. And then I will just set my box, make sure that's highlighted, get a box. I'm going to set my box inside of that point. 
I don't want to collect, collect the same points with the same things in both. We should collect uh, data uh, as if it was mutually exclusive. And again, I click on the icon and I get an area. And if I'm over here, I lost my box, but if I had a box, I could get the mean. In fact, I can ask for the mean anyway, and it's an incredibly tiny number and should be very close to zero. The next set of data points is the rubber bumper. And here you'll start to see why I wanted you to think about how long that collision took. Here this thing is zero, 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 and then bang, a very, very sharp peak. I told you before that this thing is measuring the force at um, 500 times a second, and there are only seven points in this peak. So it's very fast. In fact, this data is a little sketchy because it happens so fast. It might have been better to run this up to eight kilohertz or even two kilohertz to collect the data. Maybe next time I will. And again, here, the velocity doesn't look like much, but it's there and it's the same deal. Here, this, is, this point is clearly under the effect of the collision, uh, but it's still quite far away. So again, you'll pick the first five horizontal parts to get your average initial velocity, your average final velocity using mean. Again, this thing oscillates. And I didn't show the oscillation in the procedure two with the magnet. It does not oscillate. It has a different shape, but once it gets over itself, it gets over itself. There's no oscillation like there is with the spring and the rubber bumper. Uh, let's move on to that final one. Final one is the clay. Clay is quite different from all the rest. One, it is fast, almost as fast as the rubber bumper. The only difference is the thickness of clay that I actually left on the front. The force and the uh, is zero until the clay hits. It jumps up and then it goes negative. No other uh, data run has that feature. Only the clay does this negative, uh, well, I won't call it a leap, but this negative shot. And then it does some, a little bit of oscillation. You should think about why that negative shot is there. And that's it for the data. Uh, I'll now show you the, uh, how it's set up on the track. This is a demonstration of uh, the equipment for uh, procedure one, trial one and two. Uh, at the far end, you can see that I have a barrier. Uh, and on the cart, I have a spring. And I'm going to set this on the cart. The track is level and I'm just going to launch it. And it's going to spring back. Pay particular attention to the length of time that takes. You'll see better in the data when you get it. Um, now give me a second and I'll set up procedure two. Here's the setup for procedure two. Same barrier except I've mounted one of those uh, magnetic bumpers on both the barrier and on the cart. Same ones we used uh, in the last lab. The polarities are switched so that they will not collide but bounce off. I put it on the track launch it. Ooh, hopefully I can do a better job than that. Launch it and it bounces back. Again, pay attention to the time it took. And now let me set up for the final two procedures. Okay, procedure three uses uh, the same barrier. Uh, the uh, magnetic uh, bumpers are gone and this time it's a rubber a knob that sits at the end of here. It is, of course, attached to a force meter inside. I put it on the track. 
I launch it and you see that it bounces back but you have to ask yourself the question does it back bounce back with the same in the same way as the first two procedures did and you'll see the difference when you're looking at the data the last procedure is uh, the same barrier same track but this time I've put a piece of clay here clay is soft I put it on the track I launch it and it stops dead pay attention to that you'll see why when I show you the data in a couple of minutes